And now an important message. Your defense is in trouble. Eddie is in the room. This is the Arsenal Vision Post-Match Podcast. My name is Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter. Gunner. Your defense is in trouble. Eddie in the room. I can't sing it. It's hard to sing, but I wish I could because it's catchy as hell and it is going up all over the world tonight and tomorrow and the day after and the day after as Eddie and Kenny Brace helps Arsenal beat Manchester United 3-2 to two in an instant Premier League classic. So finely balanced, so evenly poised that it was just 3.2 expected goals to 0.4, just the 25 shots to 4. It was just that finely poised. That I mean, you know, how could anybody see such a close game coming? I'm kidding, but we'll probably touch on the finely poised nature of this game in which we dominated Manchester United, and yet another hurdle has been leapt over. Everybody's starting to see the truth, apart from Richard Keyes, who is still wondering why they haven't shown if Zinchenko was offside or not. A lot of very online references, by the way, so far, if you're not in tune with any of this, uh, the Eddie thing, you're going to have to look that video up on the internet. But uh, Eddie and Kedia, I guess, had it had made his way to him because he posted it himself. Your defense is in trouble. Uh, and then God's plan. So, you know, he's um, he's on top of it. There's so many fun little things. This is the, one of those moments where you're like, if you've been on a break from social media, stop that break. <laughs> get back on social media. If you know, if you if you don't watch match of the day, you're gonna find a video. Watch match of the day. There's there's so many things to consume. Um, just a blast recording the instant reaction at full time yesterday. I'm so pleased to have the chance to discuss this game and where it leaves us at the halfway point. Fifty points halfway through the season, and as another famous man once said, "Whoa, whoa, we are halfway there." Whoa, whoa, living on a prayer. Take my hand and we'll make it, I swear. Whoa, whoa, living on a prayer. Living on a prayer. Okay. Um, <laughs> Paul's on Twitter. Pause my pants. Help us. Woohoo. Clive's on Twitter. Clive PFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. <laughs> Tim's on Twitter. Still, hello, Tim. No, Tim's on Twitter. Still, Nader. Hello, Tim. Hello there. Yep. Uh, I mean, at least I'm getting the correction right before being corrected. Um, Cl- Clive's pregnant pause threw me. I had it. I had it in my head, and then the pregnant pause took it out of my head. Okay, Clive, you get to start today because you were our man at the ground. Uh, Tim did not make it for reasons that are quite disappointing and upsetting, but uh, we all enjoyed this game from wherever we were and wherever you were around the world. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Um, just the sense of, of joy sweeping through Arsenaldom. The, we, we went into this one having been, I think, unlucky with the fixtures because our Everton game not being rescheduled because the Premier League has apparently forgotten about it means that Manchester uh, Manchester City were able to come back and, and beat Spurs because Spurs are shit and they get battered everywhere they go and then go on to pound Wolves. And suddenly this real gap that we had is two points. And so even though there's the couple game in hand, couple games in hand, there's that narrative that they're breathing down our throat and the pressure is on. You're breathing down our neck. Breathing down your throat would be, you know, you'd have to like open your mouth and they'd breathe right into it. And like, you know, look, we just came out of a pandemic. Don't do that. But um, breathing down our throats, our, our necks. Clive, the energy <laughs> at the stadium was electric. It, it was extraordinary. You had all the ups and downs falling behind equalizing, taking the lead, being clawed back, and the late winner. Walk me through the emotions of an extraordinary day at Emirates Stadium. Yeah, I try to <laughs> I try to I try to get that close to you guys. I will say to you, getting off the train at Finsbury Park, trying to get in the 12 pins, no chance. This is like two and a half hours for kickoff, by the way. No chance. Across the road, no chance. Walk way down to the gunners. No chance. No, past the tavern, no chance. The gunners a little bit of chance. I look up to the bank of friendship, no chance. I'm thinking, flipping out. I've done like, my watch is pinging, saying, do you want this hike recorded? I've not had a beer yet. Do you know what I mean? And, um, and I'm thinking, this isn't good. Go back to the gunners, get in. Tim knows what I'm talking about now. Right? He knows exact routes because there's similar routes that he's done in, in the past. Then kind of have just get one drink, squeeze one in, then go across to get to the ground. So let's go to the ground early uh, and get into the ground and have a chat with one of our patrons actually have a chat with him and my boy and then go in a little bit early and at Arsenal it's always quite a late arrival into the seat job place mm. but not not Sunday 
it was going <laughs> off. It was going off. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, what time is it? And um, I literally look at my watch, and that was a sign. And I, I, you've heard the term electric so many times, but that is the, it's the only phrase to use. It's the only word to use. It is electric. It really is. I just cannot describe it to you in all of my time, all of my time, in my whole life, it has never been louder or better or more unified than what's happening now. And it's stepping on from Liverpool, from Spurs. It's getting better and better and better week on, week out. And um, yeah, there was a moment there when they um, when they scored the second goal. Or is it the, fir- the first goal? When, when Rashford scored the first goal, which was an absolute peach. It was a peach, right? And there was a moment of, oh my goodness, it's Manchester United. You suddenly remember their badge and, and all the scars we've had in previous years. And then I was in the upper tier and basically everyone stood up and just started saying, no, we're not accepting it. Stand up, start cheering. And it just started. Immediate thing happened, reaction to the goal. Everyone's roaring. And that just that must have destroyed the Man United fans. Must have destroyed them. And within five minutes, we've equalised and so many memories from that game and I kept I, I didn't I don't think I assessed it well in the instant reaction earlier I was just so absorbed in it so emotional about it it was it, I keep saying it I thought I thought it sound boring right but it's in my top five but so was Liverpool and so I, was Tottenham I don't want to say you know, so. I don't want to say you remind me of Lacazette but you were blowing out your ass in the third <laughs> recording you sent me I just, yeah, I just was gonna walking, let you know <laughs> I was walking on that one and basically yeah it, it it's just incredible, and it it's just incredible. And I was around the ground for hours afterwards, and it just kept going mm. on and on. There was, like, music videos being done. There was, like, different <laughs> groups of people around. And I'm thinking, what is going on? I mean, seriously, as for getting in the pubs, it's just a joke. Uh, in the end, I just gave up and I had to come out. And um, so, yeah, people are enjoying it. And, um, yeah, I, 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 I said it was the game of the season, and that's how I felt. And would that be fair comment? Game of the season? Full I, I, stop? I think it is. And like, look, I've I've been going big with the it wasn't a close game. Like, it wasn't played as a close game. But it was, of course, a close and tense game. And we did not win it until the 90th minute. So, like, I'm being a little facetious. I just, I think that the there has been an overstatement of United's quality given the disparity in control, domination, and and scoring chances, Clive? Mm-hmm. Can I just say one last thing on that? Because Please. I, yeah, I yeah. walked out of there half time, but I was worried. And then second half, they stepped back. But you, you could have yeah. knocked me over with a feather when I heard we had 60-plus touches in their box. It felt different to what it actually looked on paper. You know, I'd be so interested yeah. if I watched that on the set, what, what would my assessment be? If you was in the ground, the relief and the tense the tension in the air. I did not see that domination that obviously came out on paper afterwards. Yeah. And, and and I don't want to dive into that too deep yet. We'll get to it, but just as a heads up, I mean, Clive mentioned it 62 touches in their box is the most by any team this season, the disparity in touches 62 to 12 or 14, something like that. The only bigger disparity is city versus Southampton this season. We outshot them 24 to 5, and the XG was 3.1 to 0.4. I think that makes it right up there as one of our biggest XG disparity games of the season. So my, my point isn't to lean too much into it wasn't a close game, because anytime you win the game in the 90th minute and you've been trailing and you've been pe- pegged back late in the second half, of course it's a close game. Um, and it was exhilarating. But I, I think the scoreline somewhat denies us the glory of the dominance of our football. But Tim, let's set that aside for a minute. I want to do the emotion part first. I want to put that up front because I mm-hmm. feel like that's the thing that I take away from this game more than anything else. Mm-hmm. I wanted to cry at full time. I saw so many people saying like, I'm crying right now, literally. Like United are still the old enemy. And I think they've been just good enough recently that some of that status had been revived. If you look at the lead into the game from like Sky and stuff, they went big with the Vanger and Ferguson and clips from the past and famous goals and really trying to play it up to be what it once was. And the thing that I think made me want to cry about this, that made it so emotional, wasn't that we won. Sure, that helps. It was the 
the inevitability of us winning. It was that we were the force of nature. Like, as that second half wore on, no matter what was coming, this wasn't a young team crumbling. This wasn't lump it into the box and try to create chaos. Our football just, it was like waves on a rock, right? And it was just wearing them and wearing them and wearing them down and pushing them back. And there's tears in my eyes watching this team play a football that is irresistible, that United literally couldn't resist it. And so I think the emotion was so big because this wasn't a scrappy back and forth game. This was an imposing, irresistible arsenal just withering down United until the goal rightfully came. And, and it felt it felt like a, a, a crowning moment where, I don't know if you've read Jonathan Liu's um, match report. Sometimes they're like poetry. He was willing to put into print, this is going to be Arsenal's title. I don't know if it will or not, but this was a moment for a lot of people in front of the whole world to say, holy cow, these, these guys are doing the stuff that we think of City as doing, and they're doing it in a way we maybe haven't seen in a while. Yeah, absolutely. Let me take this from two angles. Um, well, may, maybe I'll throw in a third one quickly. But what yeah, Clive said the about angles. you know the the top five games and all of that. If you look mm -hmm. back on title winning seasons, there's never one game. There's like four or five where, you, and then they're like little fence posts in the season, mm -hmm. and you believe a little bit more after each one. Like look back at the last year we won the title. Right, we have that man new game where we get out alive and we draw nil nil. And then a month later, we beat Chelsea at home. And then a month after that, we get a jammy win against Tottenham. And it just, it builds gradually. And all of them are a little fence post on the season. But the two angles I want to take this from, um, first of all, the opposition. Look at the, like, if you want to see Arsenal's dominance crystallised, look at the behaviour of the opposition. What were United's substitutions? Mm -hmm. They didn't bring Fred on because they were trying to win the game. They were trying to not lose it. And th that shows where they are in their process at the moment. To, to, um, to be fair, taking Anthony off could be how you're trying to win the game because <laughs> that guy yeah, is fair. shit at football. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, so, like, and don't get me wrong, we were there not long ago. We were bringing yep. Rob Holding on. Um, you know, for Nicola we, Pepe, yep. <laughs> we, we've done that stuff, yep. we've, and, and I know we brought Rob Holding on this time, but very different. And and also look at look at David de Gea's like really appalling play acting, like in the eighty fifth minute. Mm -hmm. That's that's desperate. That's desperate. That is, we are on the absolute cliff edge, hanging by our fingernails, and we want to do anything we can to hold on because we know we're under the cosh. Mm -hmm. Shaw getting booked um, on Saka because he couldn't live with it. Like, and I remember one of the things. So to bring this on to like maybe the emotional side, the way I experienced this game, um, I, I was going to cover the women's game, which was then called off. So I made my way home. I decided not to go and watch it in a pub. I had my iPad with me, so I watched it on public transport on an iPad, right? And that means that you can't really respond emotionally to the game. I mean, oh, you can. Yeah. yeah, you can't punch the but, air and scream. And yeah, then... yeah. Like, I'm not going to do that. I'm on a train full of people. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, when when Saka scores, I'm down in, like, in the lobby of a train station because there's an attack unfolding, walking to the bus stop, and I stopped and Saka scored, and it's like, right, okay, now I'm, I'm going to go to the bus stop and get on the bus. Like, you know, so you experience the game differently. I got home on about 80 minutes and then watched the last 10 minutes on TV with, with, with my wife and daughter. So that's a period where you can be yourself more <laughs> watching with my wife who supports Arsenal as well. So, like, then you're feeling it more. And I was, and, you know, obviously the closer you get to the end of the game, the more emotional you are anyway, but I was able to be myself and I was able to swear. And I remember some mm. of the comments I made, like I was saying to like the 62 touches in the box thing. Yeah. It felt like to me, they all happened in the last minute. And I, I like <laughs> at one point on about 84 minutes, I said to Debs, I was like, they literally have 11, all 11 of their players are in the penalty area. Yep. That's dominance. Mm -hmm. That is dominance. Even when teams set up to defend against you, Newcastle didn't have 11 players in the penalty area, right? They had eight or nine, and they left Callum Wilson up front. United weren't even leaving anyone up front. It was, we are all completely pushed back, and that tells you something as well about the dominance. And, and so, yeah, of course, like, then the emotional elation of, of the late goal and everything like that. 
and being able to experience that in a space where I could be emotional about it and share it with other people who cared about it um, as well was, was very, very different and very interesting. And, you know, personally, after what was a pretty bad day, hmm. um, traveling, getting about three quarters of the way to a game that's then called off, um, it validated my decision to come home uh, to watch it and I didn't get the FOMO quite as much but but yeah like I'm with you Elliot this this I tweeted on about 83 minutes I said I cannot believe the aggregate score at this moment in time from these two fixtures is 5-3 to United mm-hmm. this season I cannot believe they've got five goals out of so little like a Lissandro Martinez header that is how freakish them mm-hmm. equalising was like the most unthinkable event that you can possibly like Rashford absolute worldy. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. with Clive. Like sometimes, like it's a little technical mistake by the halfway line, maximum punishment from a pretty first class player. Yes. Lissandro Martinez header. When does that ever happen? Well, it's it's a it's a keeper howler. Let's just <laughs> let's it's, just call it, it is it know. is yeah. right. And and obviously, I'm I'm trying to take the piss here a little bit. But yeah, yeah, yeah. United scoring five goals against us this season. I think allowing for the class of Rashford, they maybe deserved two of them. And I was just like, I was cursing the universe. And I was like, this is <laughs> such an injustice. I cannot believe this is 2-2. Like, this is not a 2 all get. That was my honest emotional response at the time. Yeah. So when we scored, it felt it didn't feel to me like, oh my God, we scored. It was like, finally. <laughs> mm-hmm. And and yeah, so I, I'm I'm with you, Elliot. This was not an even game. United defended and they defended well, but that's not what they wanted to do. I don't think they defended their penalty box well. They blocked a ton of shots, like you know, and that is part of the game. You have to do that. But and it's easier to do when you've got eleven players in your penalty area. Yeah, th- think about this: Rashford scores from outside the box brilliantly. Martinez scores from a, a goalkeeping error. Name the other chances they created. Just start naming them. There's one Rashford shot well saved, but it's deflected, right? And that's the only reason it's really dangerous. Other than that, they don't have, they don't have, I mean, they only had five shots. Other than that, they have almost no chances. Um, but, but yeah, I think there's so many reasons the emotion of this just connected so intensely. And by the way, the players too, you can see the, the thing I love, the Bukayo and Eddie and Kedia relationship is so wholesome, right? Two, two Hale and kids like, their interviews, so wholesome, so good. And in a way, I think like their wholesomeness and especially Saka's wholesomeness works to his advantage because he's a killer. And somehow like the likability and the sweetness of this of this man means that like he's just not given killer status. You know what I mean? He's, and that's fine for me because he, he absolutely, I mean, Luke Shaw has been having a great season. He could not live with Bukayo Saka. All he could do was drop off and hope for the best. Um, and we'll get to Bukayo in a moment. But Paul, like, I I think, you know, looking at the way Mikel reacts, the little smirk when asked about the yellow card, and he says, "Oh, we can all do better in it. Uh, <laughs> um, we can all do better in life in it." Uh, and and you know, the Bukayo and Eddie interviews, Zinchenko, you know, he he did an interview with Sky that I thought was just first rate. If you have, can find a link to it, um, it was on the coverage that Sesk was doing, like really first rate interview. I know it's so cliche for them to say one game at a time, things like that, but like they don't seem overwhelmed by this. They they really do seem to just be chilled the fuck out. You know what I mean? Like they they don't they don't really seem overwhelmed. And so while we are all <laughs> flipping out and losing it as we should, that I really get the sense that they are enjoying it, that they are motivated by it, but that they really have their head on their shoulders. And I realize it's a difficult needle for Mikel to thread with the group, but he seems to be threading it beautifully. Yeah, I think Zinchenko talked about how he was talking to these players saying, you you got to enjoy it as you go, which is going to be essential, not because, like, I don't actually care if they enjoy it. I care if they stay loose enough <laughs> to be good. Yeah. Um, and really, you know, are any of them really enjoying it? Uh, they're enjoying the end of it. They're enjoying the results. They're enjoying the goals, but they got to just stay, manage themselves in a zone of emotion as this goes along. I do think the run in last year, despite Mr. Neville thinking uh, our losing out on top four would be a huge issue for us psychologically, for the manager, for this team. I mean, you can see they learned all the good lessons from that run in. Well said. 
Yeah. They know we it was a pretty good run in till we ran out of players. But they also know that there's going to be twists and turns and that you can't you know, what was our real issue with the run in last year? We lost three games in a row. We will lose one at some stage here that we shouldn't lose because Not the sure gods about are against that. us. <laughs> Not sure about uh, that. <laughs> and our job is to bounce back immediately. In this game, there were three gut checks, right? Mm-hmm. That Rashford world he gold out of nowhere, and he put it in the back of the net. And like I don't know how everybody else felt. My re- immediate reaction was, oh, fuck, is this where the bubble bursts? And then the crowd wells up, goes nuts. We've scored within five minutes, um, and it's back on again. And that stuff just, that's that's adding each time to the belief. Like, uh, my headline in the instant reaction was belief. And that is something you build. And belief is when we lose a game and cu- that we shouldn't have lost, or we were unlucky, or whatever, and you bounce back immediately stronger. Um, it'll happen at some point. Uh, in this particular game, there were multiple gut check moments, right? The second goal, it felt good. We we felt we were 2-1 up. It it felt in hand. It felt under control. And then out of nowhere, this jammy, stupid corner that we fluff. And it's 2-2, and all your good work is undone. And, like, we grafted, put them under pressure. But it's 88 minutes. And it, it's, it's coming, it's coming, but... It, you know, it might not come, but like this was it. This was building enough pressure, getting them under enough pressure, getting them under, under enough stress that it became inevitable. So this is a signature game because champions, champions uh, winning teams have a game like this where they come back. And we're probably going to have to have two, three, four more of these where in that last five minutes, we have to know there's a goal coming. And we have to know that the bench is kicking in and that the waves keep coming. This yeah. this was a huge psychological game for us, especially given the opponent. The st- and, and, and like one last point, I can hear you're yeah, ready please, to please, grab please. hold of it. No, I, I just wanted to jump on something you said. Yeah, go for it. <clears throat> we have gone from the period in this season where we thought we weren't getting enough credit. They didn't see what we were doing in one game. You missed the middle bit where we're getting the right amount of credit. Now it's going to be <laughs> too much up. credit. <laughs> it's going to be overhype. People we've never yeah. heard of. People who played one game for us. People, <laughs> people who have no right to ever have an opinion on us are going to be claiming things about how we've got it in the bag, how we got it won, how they saw it coming. It's like the overhype is going to be. We're going to be praying for people to talk about us less. There's nothing yeah, you- in the middle. You're going to be listening to Jeremy Aliadier's podcast by next week. Like it's, going to, it's going to get to that level. Um, like the thing I wanted to say, because you put this in my mind, people always say champions can win ugly. Champions win when they're not playing their best football. I've never liked that. I've never liked that saying. Because all that saying is you played bad and got a win you probably didn't deserve. Like you got lucky. Champions get lucky. The champions do get lucky, but you know what real champions do? Champions keep playing sensational football for 90 minutes until the opposition can no longer withstand. We got pegged back because we we had a goalkeeping error. We got pegged back by a, a Galazzo. Fine. Our football was so irresistible that eventually they crumbled. That's that's the thing, Paul. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Man City didn't didn't win and won't cough up this title by winning lots of games ugly. They're going to trance a lot of teams. We're going to have to trance a lot of teams. A yes. lot of this, uh, no team has ever whatever uh, with that number of points by this point in the season and has not won the title, except they weren't up against Manchester City. Like You're, you're uh, right. And, and let me say... All, all, all history's yeah. out the window because you ain't playing Man United. You ain't playing Chelsea for the title. This is Man City. There's only We have to do what we did yesterday again and again and again. And I think we mostly will. But you know what's interesting? And this is why Premier League is really unique and, and really special and also different from American sport. We don't have to beat Man City to win the title. Agree with we that. We have to beat everybody yeah. else. And like they're the only team that I look at right now and say they could beat us. I mean, other teams can beat us, but we won't go into any other game but the Man City game feeling like we're not a big favorite to win that game. By the way, this this is why 
you guys, this is the difference a season makes. Because when Ben White's off his game and on a yellow card at halftime, last season you're looking and you're saying, well, do we bring on Cedric at halftime or do we stick with Ben White? And you stick with Ben White and he gets a second yellow and you're down to 10 men you don't win. This season. Should have brought actually on just Cedric. This, just this window. Just this window. Maybe Martinelli was growing into the game late, to be fair. But you bring on Trossard. He plays an important role in the winning in the winning goal. That little bit of extra strength in your squad. Look at the difference it makes. Right? That 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 is the difference between you're clawing for fourth and you're clawing for a title. Clive, let's let's go right to a, a thing that I think we should we should skip skip past stuff and get to this. I think one thing that happens is we we have views on games, on teams, on players, and those views are informed by our understanding of the game and our reading of the game. And a lot of times they wind up being right, and a lot of times they don't. What I know about myself is that I develop strong priors about certain players, and I try to be willing to move off them, but sometimes I just can't. Francis Coughlin never warmed to him. Never warmed to him the whole time he was at Arsenal. Olivier Giroud, I liked him. I didn't think he was good enough for us, and I never really warmed to him. And part of that is because in the big moments, Francis Coughlin was bouncing off Eden Hazard's ass. Right In the big moments, Olivier Giroud was fluffing chances against Monaco. Eddie Nketi is a player I had doubts about. I was open to him, but I, I didn't think he could be at the level to help us go to where we're going now. And and he was proving me wrong and proving me wrong, and I've been warming to him, I've been warming to him, but he needed he needed the signature big game moment, right? And then... And then it's it's all gravy. And this this is such a wonderful moment. And oh, by the way, he's a Halen kid, and Halen kids are easy to like. The club backed this player. They knew him better than anyone would have. He's had to step in for Gabriel Jesus. He bided his time. He waited for his opportunity. It came last season. He showed what he could do. It came again this season. And he has been not just good, sensational. And th- this game, Clive, this is this is the Eddie game. This is this is his ascendancy. And I think if if the only thing missing for Eddie is the belief that he belongs, that's there now. And look out league, because I think an Eddie and Kedia with his finishing ability and some of his technical quality and the belief that he belongs, he's going to be a lot to handle. But but how do you feel watching this player have have this moment on such a big stage? Yeah, I, I had doubts. Um, I had doubts about certain aspects of his game, which I pulled apart. And um, and I don't see the same things happening as often anymore. And, and to be honest, yep. even... When you see someone improving, willing to improve, you have to you have to say so, right? And um, and against Spurs, there were missed chances, but no one, none of us mentioned it, did we? Because the performance is what really matters, right? And um, mm-hmm. and it's quite interesting. There was a missed chance at the end of Newcastle. We didn't we didn't win the game. None of us really keyed on it too much because he did everything right. A couple of missed chances at Spurs. We didn't mention it. He missed a chance here in this game. And if it ends 2-2, I wonder if we start talking about it. I wonder if we do. But for me, to be consistent, when Gabriel Jesus missed her chance at Southampton, we spoke about it, but we didn't rip the player apart, did we? You know, and I think because of how we played in that game, you know, Jesus played at Old Trafford was fantastic. We didn't win the game, you know. And I think what we, what I was worried about originally was, would we still get impact from the front four? And we still are as a unit because we are a team which is a unit. And he has enabled that unit while bringing his own special source to it. And seeing it live yesterday, I thought he was fantastic at Spurs as well, by the way. I thought that was a, a real step in belief away from home. And he's got better every single game. Like an escalator just going up and up and up and up. And this one wants to step on again. I mean, seriously, those two guys at the back there are decent for United. And he ran them around. He came short. His touches were much better when he came short. He took it on the angle, came to the sides. He tackled back. He was a threat in the box. The first goal, the the movement in the box was just, where did it come from? You know, seriously, we were watching it, and I'm watching it. I can see everything, and I didn't see that coming. So, poor wan had yeah. no chance, right? So, um, and, then, and, he, and he's and a good he, defender. wan is, it, whatever you want to say about him, defending, I think, is his, you know, is where he excels. Yeah, yeah so wan is fantastic down one side. You take him on down his right leg, he's just stupid, right? But strangely mm. enough, anything straight he can deal with, but anything coming across him, he goes to sleep. And so that's mm. that's quite well known to Manchester United fans, but, you know, I'd forgotten. <laughs> so, uh, and so, yeah. He you looked, know, just on that, 
Sorry, just on that, no, Clive, Gary Neville said something really interesting. Like right at the end, he made a slide tackle on Martinelli in the area. Yeah. And Gary Neville was kind of saying, usually you'd tell a fullback not to do that. But yeah. actually, wan is really good at it. Like even in the area, like sliding on his ass and making sure he gets the ball. He said that like he kind of defies convention a bit because you can trust him to get that right. Yeah. He has got a great long leggy tackle. It's on the Wemba Saka podcast, but I know what you mean, Tim. He's got a great long leggy tackle. And by the way, <laughs> I see him play against Mbappe and he stopped him. So you've got to go on his inside. He, and I might have nearly did. And so back to Eddie, I, I, th- I, I just really, this game, I didn't know he scored the last goal. I'll be straight with you. I thought Odegaard had scored. <laughs> like, I thought he swept mm-hmm. in. And, but and if he hadn't have scored, he still would have been my joint man of the match. Do you see what I mean? On pure effort and work rate and presence and how he helped pin them back. You know, I, I just thought he was a proper first team player. Proper first team. Not someone filling in. Proper, proper first team. And I always judge people against the big teams. I always do. Big teams, home and away. What you got? How do you make me feel? How do you make them feel? And he didn't make me feel like with a supply teacher in. Do you know what I mean? He was like, we had a proper player up there. And yeah, I, I just thought he was was excellent. Absolutely excellent. He he was he was brilliant. And let me just give you this real quick. Okay. This is the leaders in expected goals per 90 minutes in the Premier League. Erling Holland at a ridiculous 0.98 expected goals. Basically, an ex- uh, he's expected to score a goal game. Not surprising given that he has 25 of them in 19 games. Now, Eddie only has 600 minutes played in the Premier League, 0.8. He's second in the league in expected goals per 90 at 0.8 expected goals per game. Now, per 90. Now, to be fair, that's helped by the fact that he's at about 1.6 expected goals in the last two games, taking, I think, five shots in both of them or something like that. But the funny thing about Eddie is when Eddie plays, he scores goals at youth level, at Premier League level, at Europa League level. Getting the chance has really been the only thing. And I, I realize we, we've had debates about, can he do the Jesus stuff? But you know what? If you can score a goal a game, it does not matter. Because, and, and by the way, he's doing a lot of the off-the-ball stuff. I just feel so happy for him. And like, I think sometimes when we're on social media or we're in the pub trying to win the argument or whatever the case may be, it can be more important to us, right? To, to have the right take or the hot take or the whatever it is. And I... I think it's just beautiful that we're having such a great season and mostly what I see of people just celebrating. And and I'm celebrating for this guy, but I mean, Tim, sometimes you have to work the ball into the penalty area and score the most beautiful, perfect goal. And sometimes you have to have the player who can win you a game on his own. Marcus Rashford tried to do that with the opening goal, right? It's not just, all right, party gives it away, but he skips past a player, right? Before he sets himself to fire it in. And and it's the whole movement. It's just, it's singular brilliance. Does Arsenal have that? We've got great players, but do we have singular brilliance? And then Bukayo Saka steps up and shows you what singular brilliance looks like. And like, we all knew Bukayo was excellent. One of the best players in the league. A scorer of good goals, a creator of good goals, but maybe not the player who can pull out, you know, the, the magic out of, out of his bag, right? He almost does it twice in this game, to be fair. He hits the post with, with a second opportunity. But that goal he scores, you won't see a better... I mean, it's better than the Rashford goal. It is. It's a harder angle. It's further out. It's got to be more perfectly struck. I think Bukayo doing that in this game is the the nail in the coffin for people who maybe don't think of Bukayo as there, as a shout for best player in the league or one of the best players in the league. It was such an imperious moment of brilliance. And like, I have to admit... I don't think I appreciated where the ceiling is for Bukayo. And at this point, I don't know what it is. I don't I don't know mm. that there's any level he can't get to. He is 21 years old and absolutely destroying the league. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm going to tie this into the last point on Eddie because I, I think what's happening is we've doctored the front line a little bit because, mm-hmm. you know, I know I said right at the outset, you cannot put Eddie and Ketia up front and ask him to wear a Gabriel Jesus mask. It is not going to work. That does not work in life or sport. You have to play towards the strengths of the people you have. 
So there's fewer rotations in the Arsenal front line at the moment. That's why some people don't think Martinelli's playing well. That's why Granit Xhaka's not scoring goals at the moment. Those left-sided rotations without Jesus, they're not there as much. But instead, we've gone, what have we got with Eddie? We've got a goal scorer. So he's picking up some of that slack. If Jesus was in the team, there's no way he has as many goals as Nketiah. But maybe Xhaka has two. Maybe Martinelli has one or two more. So Nketiah's picking up some slack. Um, there and like you said, while he's doing 0.8 xG per 90 minutes, he's doing his job doing that. We've done things slightly yep. differently, but you know the strength this season is. You look at look at like even now, look at the goals across that front five. They're, they're almost perfectly evenly distributed. Um, the reason they look like that for Ed, like Eddie's done it in far fewer games, but like I say, there's a bit of give and take there. But you can't just have Eddie, right? <laughs> that like that's not going to work, um, and that's that's not a criticism of Eddie and Ketty. You need other guys in your front line, you know, doing stuff. We've seen Erdegaard doing it, and in this game, you know, you referenced Jonathan Liu's match report, and he made the um, he made the comparison to Mohamed Salah. And he said, like, just as Liverpool were getting towards that, oh, they could win the league kind of thing. It mm-hmm. was largely because Salah was exploding and you're going, right, this isn't just a scoring streak anymore. You know, this isn't just this, like, when do you lose four? When does form just become, no, that that's just where this guy is. And a mm-hmm. lot of that is determined by when you do things. And and in this game, like, you know, we're talking about, you know, making comparisons to the last time Arsenal won the league in the Invincible season. When we go to Anfield that season, winning goal, Robert Perez, 30 yards, curled it in the top corner. But he did it at Anfield when it was 1-1 with 10 minutes to go. That is the difference. That yep. is what's because pretty much any professional footballer can score a long shot. Pretty much any of them can. Um, you know, given enough attempts, but it's when you do it that really matters. And this was a real, I don't, sometimes we're, we're guilty of superimposing narrative onto things, but I still think there's something in these big games when there must be tension. You must like, you must feel it in the crowd, even if you don't feel it within yourself, Mm -hmm. where it's like, it's one, one against Manchester United. We, we want to win this game, you know, like a draw, like I said before the game, a draw would not have been a bad result for Arsenal at all, given the advantage they've got at the top of the league. But that clearly wasn't in the thinking of the players. And that's why they're top of the league. That's, you know, that's not a paradox, but there has to come a moment sometimes where someone just says, okay, I'm doing this now because we've got United Penn back. They've got a very expensive defence there. We're talking about wan Bissaka cost £50 million, and that was like yeah. four years ago. Okay, And he barely plays anymore. And they've got £70 million, like Harry Maguire on the bench. Like They've spent an incredible amount of money. Lissandro Martinez. You know, Lissandro wanted, Martinez, yeah. yeah. Even Luke Shaw, they bought him in like nine years ago for like £32 million. Like, it's one thing to pack your penalty area with defenders. It's another thing to pack them with like two hundred million pounds worth of defenders. And so there has to come a point where someone has to do something. And that really felt like a, I'm going to do something here. This is like, you know, it's it's not enough for me anymore just to have the beating of Luke Shaw. Saka had the beating of Luke Shaw all day, and Luke Shaw's had a really good season. He's a good defender, and. And he he got mullered. But there comes a point where it's like, it's not enough for me to monster Luke Shaw anymore. I'm gonna cut in and I'm gonna get past Ericsson and I'm gonna get past, and I'm gonna smash the ball past David De Gea, who can't do anything with his feet, but is still a very good shot stopping goalkeeper, as he showed in this game. There has to come a point where mm-hmm. you do something a little bit different, a little bit daring, and that, and you can you can't win without those attackers that won't do that. Which is why I'll always give slack to players like Martinelli, like Alexis Sanchez, because like as much as you get frustrated when that shot goes over the bar or past the post, you don't win these games without taking those decisive Great actions. Great point. Yep. And obviously, what really marks out the best players is that they're successful more often than not. So like. Much as we all dislike him, someone like Cristiano Ronaldo, he does the difficult, risky thing. But like, what separated him during his career was that he he pulled it off more than most people. It's the same with Salah. There are there must I, I reckon I could pick at least twenty or thirty Liverpool goals he scored where 
like there's Roberto Firmino or Mane standing on the back post going, give it to me. And he's <laughs> like, no, I'm no, not giving no. it to you. <laughs> and, and of course, you don't want too much of that. But, you know, there, there just comes a time sometimes where you have to like put your big boy pants on and have a shot. And, and you know, I think we are, we're seeing, I, I don't think any of us are that surprised by this. We, we've all seen this escalation. I've said before, it reminds me of Fabregas and it reminds me of that Fabregas season where he started scoring goals. Mm. And we saw we had this supernova talent, but he was doing like two goals and eight assists a season. And then all of a sudden, double figures, goals and assists. And, and, and that's where Saka's going at the moment. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Saka and Martinelli are younger than uh, Mikhailo Mudrik, just for those wondering. I- I'm going to go big on this, and, and Paul, I know you want to add. There had to be a point at which Iron Robin figured out, oh, I can just cut in on my left and curl it into the net. I'm just going to start doing that all the time. right? There had to be a point where Theo Walcott figured out, oh, from the right channel, I can hit it low across the keeper and score. I feel really comfortable doing that. I'm going to do it three times against Croatia or whatever it was. right? There's a moment where a player figures out I'm I'm the guy I'm that guy. I'm him. Yeah, Henry you know, Henri curling it in the far corner, right Tim? Um I mean I think this is a big moment because Saka scores that goal and what does he do later? He tries it again and almost scores it again. Very unlucky. A little deflection takes it onto the post. I think we're going to see Bukayo Saka realize I can get it onto my left foot and shoot anytime I want and I'm good enough to score from there. And I think we're going to see him do that more. And I think it's going to add a string to our bow as a team because we won't have to break teams down quite as much because Bukayo's just going to do it for us. It's just going to cut in and score. And oh, by the way, it's also going to mean teams have to overcommit to that. And Bukayo has two feet and he can go down to the byline and he can cut it back to Odegaard or cut it back to Enkedia. I I just think that's a big moment for Bukayo to realize, oh, I'm him. I'm the guy. I'm the guy. I'm, I'm going to put it on my left foot and score goals from there. Paul? Yeah. Um, so hitting on a couple of points that came along there, I think it was Saka in his interview after the match talked about how uh, United were the only team who had beaten us this season. And mm-hmm. basically they wanted to correct that. And it lets you know the players are playing games within games, right? Uh, Clive talked on the instant reaction uh, about uh, the battle between Shaw and Saka. And the, like, why will these players not get overawed as the season goes along? Because they have a game within a game they're playing. That keep, that's what keeps them in the zone, that keeps them in that moment. Saka beating the guy he trains with, uh, uh, a fellow international within the England camp, is part of what he's doing. They all have their matchups. They all have the, the things that are keeping them. You know, Martinelli finding a solution to Juan Bissaka one way or another. These battles within the games. I think... Uh, to Tim's point about this would have been an okay draw. Um, I think when you step back and look the bigger picture, that's the case. But these players didn't want to draw. They wanted to settle the score. And that's the kind of thing that keeps you rolling from game to game, 10 minutes from 10 minutes, battle to battle throughout the season. And we may be the ones who are getting way more nervous than the players for most of this season. There'll come a point when they'll... They'll get the big gut checks later on in the season. But they're having fun. They're having their battles. Each game is a chance to prove a point. Like there's so much bragging goes on between players in dressing rooms, uh, interna- within the international, dre- the national team, the international dressing room. Um, they got scores to settle. Um, you know, Saka thinks he's better than everybody he faces from the national team because he pounds them in training, in practice for the England team. Um, there's all sorts of games within games it will be fun to know about. I just think that's that's why they don't get phased when they come up against the United and think, oh, a draw would be quite a good thing here. Um, like, they just think this is something they can do. they they got a score to settle. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting in games like this too because... There are the unsung heroes in a way because when you have really big moments, you can miss little things. Like a couple things I loved. So uh, Shaka's assist to Enkedia for the equalizer. It's such a good cross. And that whole thing comes because Martinelli pressed. Who did he press on the touchline and win it back off of? Was it Juan Bissaka? Did he take it off of? And then we get the corner from it. Yeah, he presses him up against the touchline, takes it off him. We get the corner and then the goal comes. Um, Saka's goal. The the stunner. 
It comes from a Shaka ball recovery after Martinelli had lost it, and they might have had a counter, and Shaka recovers the ball brilliantly. These little unsung moments. At one point in the first half, I had Shaka as my man of the match just for doing all the little things, getting all the details right. But Clive, the man who seems to, I think, really be having the transformative impact on how we do this, and we're talking about him a lot now, is Alexander Zinchenko. In that Sky interview I referenced, he said something that I loved, and apparently they were having a huddle before the game. And he said, what, what did you tell the boys? What did you tell them? He said, I, I said, you'll regret not enjoying this more when you look back on this season. Make sure you're enjoying it. Make sure you're really enjoying it. And I love that mindset because instead of being scared of it and wanting to get through it and be on the other side of it, soak it up. Enjoy the intensity of it. And the players do look now. Not like at the end of last season, and I realized we ran out of players and that's part of it, but they looked scared of the moment. It was too big for them. Now they look like they are soaking up the moment. And and if you look at a touch map from Zinchenko Clive and and you hadn't been watching Arsenal this season, you'd say, I have no idea what position that player plays. His ability to find the free man is utterly unique. And he does it stepping past players. He does it with the simple pass. He does it with the, the clever pass. I, I think he is the player who has unlocked the level we've reached, um, maybe more than anyone. I'm just so captivated by the role he's playing. And I'm curious if you have a thought on what he's unlocking for us and how it's sort of changed just who we are in possession. Well, he's unlocked a level of football that I didn't know existed. It's okay, as simple as that. <laughs> if you, if, if, let's be honest, we, we've, we've all been to a few games. We've all been around a while. Um, I've not seen this before. Not to this level. I have not seen this. And I, I really was so encouraged by the courage and bravery we showed in possession and which he does. Mm. There's something I want to explain. Is we, We've spoken about triangles and diamonds before, right? But what Sinchenko has brought to us is almost like the concept of the floating triangle. And so the third person makes a run off, off someone's shoulder and the triangle moves shape. Shaka did it a few times. Sinchenko does it all the time. The floating triangle to, to break into space almost like a third man run on the triangle. That is so technical, so hard to do. We did it multiple times. And on occasions it went wrong. But then our reaction to win the ball back was really, really good. I I just thought that technical level and ingenuity, it got into Manchester United's heads. And people like him, who just keep popping up places, are just are just spooking people. James and a wonderful thing calling him the queen you know, on the chess on the chess board. I thought it was a wonderful analogy. And when, mm. when I was younger, we had a pro player in our in our school year, and he was so good, we'd stick him in goal. And he'd say, "Okay, I'll be rush goalie." Then he'd pop up everywhere, just come out and run for everybody and stick the ball in there because he was a pro. He went to be a pro <laughs> footballer, and they were much better than the rest of us. And it feels like he's playing rush. He's playing rush goalie. He's out there just doing anything he likes, going everywhere he likes. But he's not running around without control. He's still in his own slot when he needs to be there. He didn't lose many battles with Anthony, by the way. And But when we have possession, the psychology from switching from defence to attack is so fast, so free, so much courage to put yourself in areas that you shouldn't be. But he's got the skill set and he's so rounded. He's got the full 360 and he's so good on the ball. And what I didn't notice when he was playing at Man City is that he's got acceleration. So when when the lanes are blocked, he just turns back into his, his circumference, turns out, and just zooms around the corner until a new picture appears. It's like, bloody hell. And, then, um, and we're all, everyone's watching in just wonderment. I, I generally, generally, he's teaching me the game, teaching me something that I didn't know existed. And yep. we all we've all learned a lot through Arteta, etc. When we signed Zinchenko, we probably thought he was a bit technical, but a weak defensively. We watched did the scout and video edit, and we saw that he's a good counter presser. We could see the zones he played in, but we couldn't measure the influence. We didn't measure this. Do you know what I mean? It's impossible yeah. to see this because this is new. And I wonder what Man City fans are thinking about this right now because they know him better than we do. Were mm. they thinking he was underused? Were they thinking he was underappreciated? You know, when when they were 
when they were shaking last game of the season, they brought him on at half time. That tells you that he's got something, you know. But I do think, again, you evolve. Like Eddie's evolved, Saka's evolving, Zinchenko's evolving into something very, very special. Yeah, if anything, I'm sure they're just wishing they had sold him somewhere else. Like the irony is, the, the arrogance of City, and I mean, I get it, is presuming Arsenal couldn't threaten them and selling two great players to Arsenal, which obviously they would not have done if anyone could have predicted this. But I mean, it is, for me, it's remarkable to see where he goes. And it's a testament, not just to him, to the team. He goes wherever he likes. But you never feel that the left flank is is like wide open and exposed. Think of the times Anthony hurt us. All right. To be fair, that's a bad that's a a bad question to ask because he's very 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 bad at football. But like still, uh, this is a true story. There, I was I was scrolling through social media the other day. I mean after the game, and someone was talking about the performance from Wout Beghorst, and I'm like, I had to take a minute to be like, no, he did he play? For, like, I'm not even kidding. Like. I completely forgot he had been playing. Name every single thing Veghorst did in this game. I can't think of one single thing he did in this game. Gabriel and Saliba were excellent without ever having to defend. That's why I find the whole narrative of it was an even game kind of interesting is name the diving tackle Gabriel made or or Saliba's last ditch challenge. Like our defense just doesn't get exposed, right? Uh, uh, Clive, it sounded like you had a Veghorst. Well, I I, I do think. I, I did. Eric Ten Hag is, is a decent manager, and he really yeah, planned no for doubt. us. Yeah, I and mm-hmm. I did maybe over index that at half time because I could see what they were doing. Right, they were. They were much get, more in the game in the first half. Maybe, they, to be they, fair, they were much more in the game. Were, we battered them. Second they half. were. They were playing this game for real, and they mm-hmm. were focusing on what they thought of our weak spots, particularly in our right channel. They they used mm-hmm. Saliba. They he put him in the air a lot rather than on the ground. And they really focused on the second ball. And that's where Veghorst was really, really good. And so one of the things we try to do is manage the regains. And Veghorst managed, managed the second ball, fought for the second ball, and gave them a level of comfort. And they tried to manage the pace of the game to slow it down because they knew they couldn't match our electricity. And and they did try to do what Newcastle did and what Spurs tried to do. But they can't do it, right? They can't sustain it. And we were able to go to the bench and then, and then manage them. I, I I do think Manchester United are a coming force without the quality, but their manager understands football. He really does. And there was a period back then when we were trying to support our manager. We were sitting in eighth, and we thought he could understood football, didn't quite have the players. Do they have the talent idea at Man United to get to the next level? Because they don't have the talent yet. They're one-man team up front. That's what they are, and we managed to. And when he tired out, they went. I can't dismiss what they are coming for us as we once were, but I think we are way ahead of them. And when I got home and yep. looked at the data, it was true. And I mean, they, they've got some things to think about because they got players that are coming up at the end of their contract. They've got some players that don't fit what he wants to do. I mean, Rashford, I assume, will stay, but you know that that's coming up. Um, Bruno Fernandez, by the way, what a nasty, nasty piece of work that player is. I mean, like he did two things in this game. One is dive to try to win a penalty when he probably could have stayed on his feet and maybe done something. And the other is kick out at, at Gabriel. I mean, those, those are the two things he did in the whole game. Um, we got, we got to talk about one little, I guess, concern, Tim. I got to get a sponsor in here at some point too, by the way. Uh, <laughs> um, ben White had a bad first half. Again, this is where having a squad matters. Because you've got last year's star of the team sitting on the bench ready to come on. I think if White hadn't picked up the yellow, he would have come out in the second half. But I, I think, and I don't know that Arteta would have made this change a couple seasons ago. I think this is growth as a manager. He's saying, you know what? The one thing I will not tolerate is us going down to 10 men and losing the chance to win a game I think we deserve to win. And why risk it? Make the Make the decision early. And you don't have to worry. And I thought Tomiyasu came into the game a little slow, but then was really, really good. Ben White was... I, I wouldn't be surprised to find out Ben White had a stomach bug or Ben White had a you know an issue because he, he just did not look like himself. But some days it's not happening for you. And oh, by the way, he's up against some talent over there on that flank. And you know whatever the case may be, pressure of the moment gets to you or you're not feeling right. Um, you get on the yellow card and once you're on the yellow card, you, you know you're playing with fire. I'm curious what you think of the Ben White situation. Also, maybe a little praise for our manager who 
while he's sometimes slow to make changes, was very quick to make one to keep this game in a position where we couldn't stupidly lose it by going down to 10 men. Yeah, absolutely. In in any good squad, you have squad players, but squad players who are still the manager's guys, not not yep. players he's tolerating, um, but players that are like, if we were playing the Champions League final tomorrow and everyone was fit, you you might not start, but I'd have I wouldn't it wouldn't keep me up at night if I had to start you type thing mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. kind of that's the role Tommy Asu's come into at the moment that's that's not the role he had last year that's probably not the role that Arsenal had envisaged for him but that's happened uh, and you know we we're developing this layer of the squad now which still needs it still needs thickening out it still needs more numbers but you know I see Trossard as a part of that right we went for Mudrick. Mudrick was the guy. Mudrick was the guy who, you know, maybe would start ahead of Martinelli and et cetera, et cetera. But we didn't get him, so we went for Trossard, who's probably not going to be the guy, but he's in that Tomiyasu, Smith Rowe, like this second layer of the squad that we're building, who are like, you're, you're not, you're maybe not in the, the absolute first choice 11, but you can fill a few roles in it, like you're close to it. You're in touch with it and not least because you can play a few different roles within it. And so th- this was just a really good example of one area of the squad where where Arteta's confident in his changes. I mean, it was literally, it's the only change he made in the Newcastle game, right? Tommy Asu for White. And on that occasion, to be honest, we were trying to, we were trying to win that game. Newcastle weren't really doing a lot. It, it didn't do a yeah. lot. But on this occasion, not only did it appreciate that Ben White did not have a good first half, and and you could see that by the way because if you remember his booking it's just after the goal and he he basically he's pissed off and he kicks Rashford basically yeah. mm-hmm. and it's and it's frustration and so sometimes a player tells you um they don't mean to tell you but sometimes they tell you like like when have you ever seen Ben White do that he's usually no. his hallmark is control like control cuz he doesn't care the, about football well yeah <laughs> but control to the point that sometimes he looks like he's taking the piss yeah, a little bit, and he didn't have that, and he lost a bit of control. And this is just what this is just one area of the squad where Arteta really trusts his bench, and it's like, well, to- Tommy Asu, like, like when that change happened at half time, I kind of said to myself, like, I think Ben White's been one of our best players this season, but I was like, fine, that's 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 not weakening the starting eleven. But I think as well as appreciating what had happened with Ben White, it's just I think we also figured out. All of United's threat is coming from one player, right? Anthony, he can spin around as much as he wants. He's not going anywhere, right? That clip that's doing the rounds of Thomas Party, like a uh, kind of sprinting back to take the ball off him in the second half, like not to take anything away from Thomas Party, but look at the touches from Anthony, like for fuck's sake, like Sunday league level. I think he was trying to take it to the corner flag. <laughs> I don't know what the hell he's doing. Just hasn't got a touch. Like, yeah. Just but still, very... where does that burst come from, from Thomas Party? Like, Indeed. I think he's just jogged for us his entire career until that moment. <laughs> Indeed. And that was like one of the only times Anthony got any space in the game. Yeah. And look what he did with it. It was like a, it was like a kid had run onto the pitch, and and so and like like you said, <laughs> Veghorst. Like if you told me he didn't touch the ball once, I'd believe you. So we we understood at uh, Fernandez. I'm sure tactically off the ball he did some stuff, but I can't really tell you anything he did on the ball. So we understood that all of their threat was coming from one player, and not only that. But like he's just scored a worldie. Like the the goal that United score, the first goal, that is not like principles of play, patterns of play. That's not something they've worked on in training. That is really, really good player in the form of his life, feeling very confident. That's what that is. So what did we do? We we cut their legs off, basically. We went, okay, they've got they've only got one threat. Let's let's concentrate resources into stopping that threat. And that, by the way, is one of the things that then allows you to push. United back. I think I read that Rashford had three touches in the final half an hour. And mm. so as much as we were pinning them back and back, Tommy Asu deserves just as much credit as any midfielder or any attacker for that because he closed that back door. And every time they were clearing it, as the game wore on, I stopped being nervous about United on the counter. And a lot of that's reputational because you still look at United and think of them as a counter-attacking team. And for the first hour, when they were booting it long, 
I was, and because I couldn't see the whole pitch and I was watching on a screen, I was like, oh God, who's running in behind here? And there are a few hairy moments, you know, Ramsdale came out for one and that could have gone very differently. But like, how many times did that happen in the last 30 minutes or so? Zilch. And I, I'm, no. I'm actually yeah. really surprised that United didn't just move Rashford up front, um, to be honest, and take him away from Tommy Asu. Not, not that I think uh, Gabriel or Saliba would have given him a lot more change, but... Um, I really think that's something they should have looked into. But yeah, t- Tommy Asu, massive, massive part of this victory. I'm really pleased for him. Um, you know, as much as Inketia has stepped up and scored the goals, you know, Tommy Asu's another one. He hasn't had the minutes he wanted this season or probably even deserves in his own right. But th- this is what coaches will tell you. Like, listen, you c- you can you can whinny about that and you can be upset about that. You can, you know, you can be in my ear about that or... You can like you can't change the past. You can change the future type yeah. thing, and that's what Tommy Asu has done. It's like right, okay, I'll come into this game and I'll be a massive part of this game, and that's that's what having good squad players is all about. Uh, in Lou's match report that I referenced earlier, um, he he made the point about the players that aren't even playing the back bench, you know, or the congregation, even they look elated. Like you know what nobody mentioned? There was not a mention I could find anywhere at the end of this game. Smith Rowe doesn't come on. Smith Rowe had no role to play in this game. But look at him after the match. Go find videos of him. Elated, hugging, cheering, right? You know, he's an Arsenal kid through and through. This is going to make him happy. Like, chances are going to be few and far between for some players now because this team is playing at a level where you're going to have to reach a really high level to get in. And when you get in, you do what Tomiyasu did, and maybe you get in again. And it's just, but everybody's rolling in the same direction. Um, Paul, I, I want to give you a, a shot to talk about some lessons we learned from the first game against... Um, against United. I also want to bring up the the Mikel yellow card. I want to talk about Trossard's uh, cameo and whether that may, you know, signal a potential change in the starting lineup going forward. There are also lots, by the way, guys, there are lots of little moments that will be forgotten because of how big this game was and the big moments. But like Martin Odegaard pulled off one of the passes of the season, a little, like rolls his ball, it rolls his foot over the ball and pokes it with a second touch, like a double touch pass into Shaq. And I could hear Clive trying to retire Shaq again because he couldn't quite find the pace to get to it and gave Lissandro Martinez just the time to get there to clear clear him out. But like, man, was that was that special? Um, hey, here's the good news: just the one sponsor today, and that sponsor is AG One from Athletic Greens, seventy five high quality vitamins, minerals, and whole food source superfoods, adaptogens. Right, it's a, it's got all the things you need for gut health, sustained energy, immune support. Uh, uh, if you hate taking pills and vitamins and gummies and all that, this is the solution. Like I started taking AG One mostly for gut health stuff. Uh, a doctor I'm friends with had it on his counter. We talked about it. He's you know talked about what it does for him, why he takes it, why he likes it better than other stuff. And I said, you know what, why not? I'll give it a try, and I really like it. I also find that it's helped me just slightly reduce that coffee intake, which had been getting. I think to be too much, you can just feel when the caffeine's not doing good things for you. And AG1 from Athletic Greens is helping me find the right balance for that and still feel like I've got the energy I need to get through my day, especially when we start recording podcasts at an hour that I am not usually awake. Um, so, you know, first of all, it's a comprehensive solution. I think so many times we have to take five, six, seven different things. It's expensive, rarely works. This is you know, whole food sourced, as I mentioned, so you can trust that your body can ingest it. It's less than the price of an expensive cup of coffee a day. And oh, by the way, uh, paleo, keto, vegan, dairy-free. So if you have a specific uh, nutritional lifestyle that you're working on, it's going to work for you. If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs. Took them to London with me when I went. With your first purchase, go to athleticgreens.com slash vision. That's athleticgreens.com slash vision. Athleticgreens.com slash vision. Check it out. Do it now. Clive, is that enough of that? Indeed. Nailed it. Okay. So, um, Paul. Yeah. What what lessons did we learn from the first United game? Because to be fair, I think we should have won that game too, but they definitely found ways to get their counterattack working. Mikel talked about it in his post-match interview. He said, you know, they they like to find the space in behind and, and counterattack on you, and we did a good job closing that down. What do you think we did better than in the first game? So huge credit to Odegaard, Party, um, the boys on that right-hand side of things, because, of course, Ericsson was trying to uh, get in space – uh, on that side of the pitch, on the 
the party Odegaard side of the pitch, look up, find Fernandez, and put us in trouble. Uh, it's interesting that Tim said they really only had one player who could threaten us, and that was Rashford. When you think that Ericsson and Fernandez were on the pitch and didn't really do anything to us, and by the way, I, were you surprised? in the absence of Casemiro, that they didn't go for Fred and McTominay, that they, that they decided to go Ericsson, Fernandez, and, and McTominay? Because that was that was an adventurous choice on their part. Um, it was. Um, but whatever they were doing, it were, like we had this conversation, it kind of worked for 30 minutes. Yeah. Uh, yeah if yeah. you look at it, they kind of nullified us in their structure, uh, still giving them a chance to connect Ericsson, Fernandez, and Rashford. Um, one one of the metrics for it was like I did think Zinchenko kind of took over the game. He was the if you want to track if you want to put a tracer in the blood as to when we really got a hold of this game, look at Zinchenko's touches. I think he had sixteen touches in the first thirty minutes, but in the next sixty minutes he had sixty two touches or something. And it it tracks to the eye test, which is. They looked, United looked like they had a good structure in that first 30 minutes or so. And then we just started to take them apart and you started seeing Zinchenko popping up all over the pitch. But in combination with that was just the work rate of Odegaard, apart from being brilliant when we got the ball, um, just him and the boys um, snuffing out Ericsson at source as he picks it up off the 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 center back or the keeper deep or drifts into a little pocket on white party's side. Um, they just all did enough to make sure they never got out of first gear. And if you think of how they hurt us in the first match at Old Trafford, it was like they got their head up. They looked ahead. They got that ball off. Oh, look, they're they're They made us look naive. It looked, mm. it, it had a touch of the kind of late Wenger era of, oh, look, we're playing great football. We really have them in trouble. Oh, shit, we just got done up the middle. And back <laughs> yeah. to my four pillars of how we win this league, three and four are don't get done looking naive, getting done up the middle by giving these guys too much time. Party being in this game rather than Sambi Lukonga as DM just meant, A, we got way more physicality and, and the ability to press. And uh, he's just he's just very astute. He, those guys can now sense the danger and be in the right spots. Chaka, all of these guys snuffing out stuff at source. Sinchenko so for us, uh, uh, front-footed so that you end up with a game like this and thinking there was only one threat there. Well, there wasn't. We just happened to keep snuffing the fire out before it got going. And the you know the other piece of it is keeping your calm, being whether it's professionalism. A little bit of shit hazardry, or just keeping your cool while they're starting to lose theirs. Um, that's how you beat the Uniteds in key games like this, and how you manage yourself through the season without unnecessary drama. And I think we saw both of those in this game in a way that we looked rattled at Old Trafford. It was kind of like yeah. I, I just think we've come up a level in terms of feeling we're legit feeling we're managing the game, feeling we have enough that we don't need to do crazy shit and leave ourselves wide up, open, and get done on the uh, counter. Yeah, I mean, the personnel matters, right? Also, yeah. like, you know, the players you have on the pitch and the players that we had on the pitch and United without wanting to single anybody out, like it's it's a different group. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, I think also the advantage of playing a team for the second time is you kind of know how they're going to try to hurt you. And, you know, then you can work on your tactics and tweak things, Paul, to make sure that you don't get hurt in that way. Yeah. No, yeah. I think that's right. I know. I Sorry, yeah. I did the old hand up. I was actually, Instead of the mute. You yeah. hit the hand instead of the mute. The good thing is I was going to give it right back to you. So the mm, generosity is there. Um, the old one too. So, so and look, <clears throat> I think the thing that about this game is the first half, one of the reasons it was a little more even is we we just, there were some sloppy giveaways. It's funny, the same thing happened in the North London Derby, by the way. Thomas Party, who has been absolutely imperious, had a few sloppy giveaways, right? But I want to be clear about something. If your intention is to play and play progressively, and you are willing to take risks, you're going to give the ball away time to time. Um, Party gave it away time to time. Zinchenko in the North London Derby, a, a couple of sloppy giveaways, 
right? If you're going to try to find the forward cutting inside off of his marker, if you're going to try to slip the ball between two defenders into a forward posting up, you know, his man, like that's going to go wrong sometimes. But you don't want the team to stop playing in that way. In the second half, we were more precise. We cleaned it up. United couldn't get the ball back. And as a result, we were able to push them back and back and back and back. And you saw it in the Derby as well, right? Once the forwards have to sink too deep, they can't get out. You know, if you're on the halfway line or near the halfway line and you get in a sprint, you got a chance to win that race. If you're on the edge of your own defensive third, you're not you're not sprinting out. You, you're not counterattack. Um, Clive, we got to talk about the Troussard cameo. Sometimes I think we have a tendency as fans to overdo it on things, right? This was a few minutes, but it was in the decisive period where we won the game. And so there's a tendency to be like, holy cow, look what he did. He, he dribbled once. He put him, you know, where's his statue? But to be fair, he he brought it back to front once when we maybe were under a tiny bit of pressure and needed to flip the pitch. He kept the ball really well late when we were finishing the game. And he does, you know, go get a pass that party just about squeezes through to him, close control, good feet, slides it to um, Zinchenko for the ball that goes to Odegaard to Enkedia for the winner. It's an immense moment. He plays his role in it. I'm curious what you thought of his role in it, especially in light of the fact that, like, once again, Martinelli, who was well off what I think he he was cap he's capable of and was doing pre-World Cup, is going to come under some scrutiny here, I think, as... I'm going to use this term very loosely, the weak link in a team that is firing on all cylinders. Now, the irony is you look at data and stuff. I was looking at like XG buildup and things like that. And he's like right near the top. I just don't think, you know, the, the, the drive into the byline isn't coming off for him lately. Like he's maybe trying to make the move that destroys the opposition a little too much. It's not coming off. Whatever the case may be, he's going to be the one where his position right now is under scrutiny because it's been a couple games since he scored or assisted. So, um, Trussard comes on, he has an impact. I'm curious what you thought of Trussard in that small cameo. And if, if, you know, he's going to start against City in the FA Cup, is is that a position he could still make his this season? So let's, let's talk you through a little bit. So the last weekend was ruined by the Mudrick thing for me until we played the North London derby. And then we saw yeah. Mudrick appear for Chelsea at the weekend, looking like an, an Adonis running across the ground, 40 kilometers an hour nearly to think, oh, goodness. Could you imagine him in Arteta's hand? Which of his goals did you like best, Clive? Yeah. I, 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 could oh, you oh, imagine? Sorry, him, he didn't score any goals. Sorry. Could My you bad, imagine bad. him in Arteta's hands, right? And which we should yeah. have got him last summer for 40 million euros. And then we would we could be having that discussion. A developmental player with lots of potential. That's what he is. Um, so then so that sort of ruined it a bit. So Trossard comes into this game. Let's talk about Martinelli first and foremost. I do these podcasts, I try not to look at information too much. While you're talking, Elliot, I look at the average positions. And they're very similar mm -hmm. every single week. The only difference is Martinelli is high one week, or Saka's high the other week. They sort of rock around depending on the fullbacks they're playing against. The Martinelli was highest in this game. And I thought he played a big part in pushing them back. The game plan is important that he's the one that pushes them back. He kept running them and running them and running them and running them. And that has an effect on you. Just because he's not putting in the last cross and the last shot, people are judging him. I think he's critical because he makes straight line runs. Saka wants to, he, he shows spin, comes short, creates inside. So the other guy's got to be a sprinter, someone that goes long, wants to take you distances. And what Eddie's done, which I really do really rate, every now and again when those two boys are not going long, he goes long, just does a channel run. Just one or two a game every time. I love that about what he's game. So Martinelli is absolutely fine. In fact, what I'm really enjoying about his game is his mobility to move across. His rotations move across the line, not as much as what, when Jesus is there. Tim's point is noted, really, really well, really well said. Not as much, but I love his bravery to get the ball inside. And I love his calmness just to keep the ball and play football just because he's not mm. sprinting down the line and crossing it and laying up in his backside like a, like a teenager. He's playing like a man now, and people have to mark him, right? So he's not just an eleven. He sometimes is a bit. He's playing like a ten in possession, and I and I like yeah. that about him. And Trossard's the same. Trossard for me is an eight ten, just playing in in lane four. If anything, he's, he's more similar to Smith Rowe. 
you know, and he and he's got that ability in small spaces, tight spaces, and we're going to see this a lot more later in the season when teams respect us even more. They go drop into their box. I'm telling you, mate, we're going to want Trossard on this pitch because he is a small space phone box demon. Gets in and out, really creative, and that goal that you know that Sinchenko put back. That could have easily been a right foot slot for Trossard running in one two big one two, and he is like a hero today. You know what I mean? But his only guy took it and it went to Eddie, and we know the rest of the story, right? So, very interesting what we're doing here. We're adding another layer into our team, you know, and and that people have to think about things a little bit different. What's he going to do now? Trossard's a proper player, international player. Proper, proper player in the Premier League. And he's thinking, he must be thinking, oh my God, I'm at Arsenal. I ain't messing this up. I am not messing. Could you imagine it? If he, he comes in and starts not playing like we do. So what's he do? Gets the ball, turns around, <laughs> runs with it. When he loses it, what does he do? Presses real quick. I better press real quick because I'll be watching everyone else pressing real quick. I have to fit what's going on here. And what I loved about him was his intelligence to work out. Okay, this is a room I'm in. I better do that. I better do it. I better do it. I can't come in and create a new room and my own room. <laughs> I'm going to do what David else is doing. And yeah, he looked like an Arsenal player to me. And one with potential to play more positions, what I think people realise. I think he can play eight. I think he can play 11. I think he can play 10. I think he can play seven. And I think he can play nine. And that's it. Mm. while part of two strikers let's have fun with him right he's going to be that sort of player he's going to be a front five player let's have fun with him yeah yeah I mean the we just also have to outgrow this whole thing of now we have another good player is the good player who usually starts first going to lose his position to the other good player we have like if you want to win a title you're always going to have some players on the bench who you're convinced would make you better if they're starting right that's just good teams have because you know what guys we may not be far away from Gabriel Jesus knocking on the door and saying, uh, I want my starting place back. Right? Now we have Troussard <laughs> knocking on the door of Martinelli's place. But guess who else is sitting there? Emil Smith-Rowe. Was he our leading scorer last season or something? I mean, like, you know, it's it's not it's not the case that you're going to win a title and have nobody sitting on the bench who you think would make you better. And we're going to have to not do the thing where the player on the bench is better than the starter and the starter shit. You know what I mean? Gabriel Martinelli, who was terrible, had five shots, four chances created, a bunch of dribbles, drew fouls. What I think United did well is they blocked shots really well in this game, you know, and like there were just Odegaard, I think, had six shots in this game, and they were they, they were like all blocked. Um, Erickson got down really well to block one of his shots. Th- there were a lot of moments where we, you know, the thing I love, I said this in the instant reaction, Tim, like we don't cross, we cut back. I, the irony is we got a goal from a brilliant cross from Shaq. So what the hell do I know? But you know what I mean? Like when we get to the edge of the box and beat a man, we cut back, we cut back. And it's because we commit so many people to the attack that the second man run is always there. It's Shaq arriving or it's o- o- Odegaard arriving. Right. And Saka's understanding of how to find Odegaard in the box is, is brilliant. Um, and, and I love the cutback and city obviously been doing that for ages. I think the thing with Martinelli is He's an end product guy, and so when he's not scoring or not assisting, the other stuff he does can look a little loose. There's a little bit of that Alexis Sanchez thing, right? When mm-hmm. Alexis is scoring a brilliant goal or providing a brilliant assist, oh my God, he's amazing. The other games, he's losing the ball 10 or 12 times, not beating a man off the dribble, and it looks a little ragged. But the first goal, the equalizer, comes from Martinelli pressing one Bissaka and recovering it, right? Like, his intensity and his energy is so critical to what we do. So I think, I think the problem is when you're playing at this level, anybody who's not at the top of their game is a target for their place and should be a target for their place, right? I mean, that's that should be how it works. And he just, yep. you know what? As much as I love him and as great as he's been, now there's this other guy here, plus there's Emil Smith-Rowe. He will have to elevate if he wants to keep that position. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, Tr- Trossard, and we're, we're looking ahead to City in the Cup on Friday, right? And uh, I, I hope we, we rotate. Um, my interest in the Cups this year, a very big departure from me, is how do we skillfully go out of the Cups as soon as possible? <laughs> like find that balance between getting eliminated but not like losing morale and momentum. But I, I think also what those players can give you is, is gears, right? So, yeah, 
like like I said earlier with Martinelli, Jesus is not there, so there's not quite the left hand sided rotations. Jack is not scoring the same amount of goals for that reason as well. It's like that there's a bit of a tax there, and Martinelli is staying wide. He's pushing people back. But look at who United selected. They selected Wambasaka, right? They've been they've been messing about with their defence a bit. They've been playing Luke Shaw at centre back. None of that against us. They play Luke Shaw at centre back because he's a good defender. So where do they put him? They put him at left back because they want him on Saka, basically. Uh, why do they select Wamba Saka? Because they respect Martinelli. That's why they did that. Um, so you know, like they. It's a good point. A, they picked yep. a very defendy defence. Wambasaka, what does everyone say and know about Wambasaka? Great one on one defender, contributes nothing going forward. But United, they were prepared to wear that, basically, mm-hmm. because they felt like him shutting the door on Martinelli was more important. And look, yeah, Mar- Martinelli, he's a volume player, as you know, just like Sanchez. Just like someone like Tevez, you know, you know, quite South American, really. But it's just like, and also when when you attack, you need some players who are structured, but you need at least one who's not quite as structured to yeah. do all of that stuff, you know, to to take those shots on to, because the whole point of Martinelli's game is that we isolate him against a fullback, and he doesn't have an overlap. He'd right. been leading the league in dribbles, by the way. So yeah, you know, yeah. that's so what he's there to do. <laughs> he's he's always one on one with the fullback, and most of the time, taking someone on one on one, it's a bit like taking a corner, right? The the, the advantage is with the defender because the defender doesn't have to do much. I mean, that's downplaying it a bit, but do you know what I mean? They're not trying to hit a tiny, precise space like an attacker is. They're mm-hmm. going. If I get a foot in and it's a throw in, I've done my job. Whereas you've got to beat me, and then you've got to score a goal. And it's the same principle with a corner. To defend it, all you've got to do is get something on it. Whereas to score it, you've got to get something on it with something. So Martinelli is always one of those players who um, his his kind of pass completion stats and stuff like that, Like I don't care about those. With Martinelli, look at shots, crosses, shot-creating actions, like the final stuff. That's what you look at with Martinelli. But what I think is really interesting here as well is when Trossard came on, it was different. We did not ask Trossard to stay on the touchline and take on wan Look at all of his touches. They're inside. They're more in like the Erdegaard space, but just on the other side. And again, like I find the comparisons with Man City kind of irresistible. It's a, To me, it's a bit like taking off Sane and putting on like Bernardo Silva. You know how City have those like those inside and those outside players? And and perhaps one of the reasons City are struggling is because they don't have the right mix there anymore without Sterling and Jesus. But sometimes they'll play Phil Foden and he's an inside player. You know, whereas sometimes, yeah, when it was Sterling and Sane, they were both kind of outside, but knowing when to come inside. Trossard yeah. comes on. I haven't looked at a touch map or anything, but nothing next to the touchline. Martinelli is next to the touchline. He's trying to slip Xhaka in on the underlap. Trossard is the underlap. Look at where the winning goal comes from. Zinchenko is overlapping him like an actual left back, right? Yeah. It's basically the only yeah. time in the game that Zinchenko does an orthodox left back thing because we changed it. It was Martinelli outside, Zinchenko inside. Trossard comes on. We swap them over. Okay, and it just gives United another problem because they didn't know, like, there wasn't someone assigned to pick Trossard up. They were ha- not happy, but like, they had Martinelli, they had Wambasaka on Martinelli. So you go, all right, we'll bring on an inside player then who'll go and stand in a different space. And then when does, where does Wambasaka go? Well, we see on the winning goal, he doesn't know where to go because Trossard's inside. Yep. He doesn't go to him, he doesn't go to Zinchenko on the outside. That's yep. where the goal comes from. That's that's what I'm talking about in getting like gears from your bench. And sometimes it's very difficult to strike this balance because you don't want guys who are too different, who like exist completely outside of your structure, like Pepe. You don't want a wild card who's like, this guy can't play our football, but he might smash one in from 30 yards. But just someone who gives the opposition a different problem. That's one of the reasons I really like the signing of Trossard. And I wouldn't mind betting, as Clive says, that he does that in different positions as we go through the next couple of years. Yeah, it is interesting the way the different flanks operate. I mean, you look at the pod on the right with White, Saka, and Odegaard. We don't have the Odegaard on the pod on the left. And Shaka, I said I had him as man of the match for part of this game, and I have him as one of our players of the season. If that player was 20% or 30% more attacky, 
I think what that does to that left pod would be pretty dynamic. And to be fair, earlier in the season, Jesus, I think, drifted left. He really liked to be in that left-hand channel, and Martinelli and Jesus obviously thrived off that. Think of the number of little slip balls Martinelli played into Jesus behind. Right, the the little times they'd say, and that's happening more with. And Kedia wants to be right in the center of the box, right, or or he'll make the near post run. He'll go where he needs to to score a goal. But he's a little more Obamiang than Jesus in terms of how he operates around the box. I want to find the space there aren't defenders and be there. Where Jesus wants to come to the ball and combine, right, and and find find contact, roll a man, combine, dribble a player. So it's a very different style, uh, Paul. The the thing about this game though, and by the way. To Martinelli's credit, while I do think he was a bit off his game, his best period was the 10 minutes before he got taken off. He had started to really come alive in the game, and I think we had ground down their, their defense a little because the last 30 minutes of this game, we outshot them 12-1, to one, two big chances, 175 passes to 65, 64 attacking third passes to seven, 10 take-ons to one. You know, the, the really good teams besiege you and force you to withstand immense pressure to win a game. It's a thing I don't think we were able to do in seasons past, and understandably, we weren't very good. But what we did to United is a thing that only the very best teams can do, Paul, which is we took that team and we pushed them right into their goal mouth. They could not get out. We shot time and time and time again from good locations. And, you know, it's funny because the Eddie goal is a little scrappy in a way, Right, it's kind of a deflection off Odegaard. I don't think that's a pass. But what in what I find interesting about this game is United rode their luck because think of the number of blocked shots they made in this game. Think of the number of little interior passes in the box, scrambles in the box where it, it didn't fall to an Arsenal player, it fell to a United player. You do that. I've always said this, right? Why do you play this way? Because if you play this way, once one of those deflections, one of those scrambles, one of those loose balls is going to land at the feet of your guy. Right? And it does right at the death, and then he taps it in. But that, to me, the character and the quality of this team is summed up by the last 30 minutes and the way we we imposed ourselves on that game with the intention of winning it. We never, ever, ever did anything other than pushing forward and pushing forward and pushing forward. It was, it was amazing to watch. Yeah, I think you'd, you could make the argument it was 45 minutes of just continual pressure. We got the goal yeah, after, what, <laughs> yeah. 52 minutes or something like that. Uh, we had a quick breather uh, and then at it again. It's just a continual onslaught. Uh, we're playing on a sloped pitch when we play like that. And everything just came back to them. It kept coming back to them. They, they'd clear it long. Uh, Saliba, Gabriel, whoever would scoop it up. Zinchenko was a the freest of free men, um, just popping up wherever he found himself. As you said, a, a, a fascinating touch match guess touch map if you ask somebody to look at the touch map and tell you what position that player picked you were not picking left full back um and for me he was the key to it all because uh the opposition just a when he's got the ball you can't do anything about him he's 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 gonna roll it somewhere between the lines that the uh the screen has no chance of stopping and like he's just popping up in all the spots that are needed to be popped up in. Um, so following Zinchenko around is following the game. I thought he was absolutely phenomenal in the second half and the reason we never really let up the pressure. Um, I think the Trossard discussion is a really interesting one and the Martinelli discussion is a really interesting one. Um, I thought Shaq had a really good game, but had Trossard been the inside eight, I think we would have a whole different reflection on Martinelli's game because uh, may not have been his desire or plan, but Martinelli was effectively pinning the full back to him. Um, what I really liked about Martinelli was he lost the ball early on, and that's another one of those which colors your view of the game, right? Early mm. on, there was a in the first couple of minutes, there was a notable he got robbed by Juan Bissaka. He mm. only lost the ball one more time at the end of the, I think it was the end of the first half. He became very patient with his game, which to us looked like he'd been somewhat neutralized, but he stretched the game up his wing and I thought it was pretty mature. He could have been like frustrated or trying to prove a point or had runner after run where Bissaka took the ball off him and he kind of played the game he was given 
And in the second half, it was critical that we didn't cough up easy possessions because somebody got a little hot-headed and tried to do it themselves, which could have been Martinelli. But, uh, like, respect to the guy for a guy so young realizing, like, if it's not there for you, you keep rolling and you keep it going. Somebody else will get in there. We were having chance after chance because we weren't giving them stupid possessions. So uh, maybe it's a bit of a backhanded compliment. But he managed... That's how it'll be in some games. And when Trossard comes on, like he had two big contributions to the goal. He drove us up the pitch. Yep. Um, like he could, we could go with Santi Trossard for for <laughs> him, who he is, how he plays. Like he's the, not there the, yet. Come on, let's. <laughs> that's well, that's praise he hasn't earned yet. Let's say yeah, well, Santi is still in a class of his own. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Um, like, but in terms of his style and the way he plays and what he brings to a game, in the same way. I think uh, Enkatia does a lot of what Jesus does, but he's never going to be world class of what Jesus is world class at. Uh, Trossard brings a lot of what Santi brought, um, and maybe a little extra goal scoring. We'll see over time. I think yep. in that inside eight channel, uh, and the beautiful thing is you bring him on, and Ten Hag is like, oh well, where is he going to play? Uh, is he to to Tim's point to to like? Is he the winger? Well, it was Zinchenko, right? Um, or the eight. Well, he probably was the winger, but it didn't really matter. He was the one who carried it up the inside channel, so he stayed there. So he was that dynamic uh, player in the pocket there on the left eight side when the goal came about. You don't really know where Trossard's going to be when you're the opposition coach yeah. and he comes on on 70, 75 minutes, 80 minutes, and it may not matter too much. He'll, he'll drift in... Like, I do think he's a very Ars- uh, Arteta Arsenal player. He's going to drift into those pockets where the chances are. And uh, I think he's going to have a great run in here. Yeah, I, it's just a great thing to have. I, I, I'm really curious to see how that left sided rotation plays out because you got Smith Rowe there, who's an important player for us. You got Trossard, you got Martinelli. Um, I, just to give the one thing, if there's a, a moment that tells you how far back we were pushing United and how far up the pitch we were. Our best penalty shout in this game came from Gabrielle getting bundled over in the box, carrying it into the box. And then he does, he does, I love it. He looks over his shoulder and he sees that someone's coming and he, he stops and gets bundled over. <laughs> it's brilliant. But um, it, it tells you so much because Gabrielle and Saliba were both magnificent in this game, but we don't really need to talk about them. You know, we really don't because, um, because, United, for all of the evenness we may have felt psychologically, didn't create much. Um, there was the ridiculous Mikel yellow card, and I'm convinced someone had said to Anthony Taylor, make sure you control Mikel. It's clear to me that the narrative the media picked up on has been, has has bled into the game. Because, all right, Mikel sometimes goes a little nuts on the touchline. Like, fine, I don't mind it. The players don't seem to mind it. In fact, I think Sesk uh, was saying in the studio show that I watched that he did, like, I like it when you have a manager take some of that attention off you and you know is going to go to battle for you so that you don't have to do it on the pitch. You don't have to take take on that psychological responsibility because the manager will, but he holds up four fingers and he doesn't even particularly thrust them at anyone and he gets a yellow card. It felt very stage managed to me, very like pre-planned. When Mikel loses his shit, we're going to we're going to rein him in a bit. Um so what? Fine. Do what you got to do. Clive, let's let's wrap up just by putting this in perspective now. Arsenal are halfway through the season on 50 points. We are halfway there. Whether you think we're going to win the title or not, we are on a pace that no Arsenal team has ever been on. There's there's just no longer any ability to look at this as luck of the fixtures or get you know getting by or oh it's going to come unglued. 50 points halfway through the season. We've played United twice. We've played Tottenham twice. We've played Liverpool. We've gone to Stamford Bridge. Not that that's any Big shakes. We've gone to the Amex, right, and put four past them. We've gone to Crystal Palace. Other teams have come unglued there. We won there at Brentford, right? Places that can be a little tricky. It, it it may happen. It may not happen. But I think kind of like what Zinchenko said pre-match, right? Make sure you're enjoying it because you, you will look back on this and regret that you didn't enjoy it more. I'm going to make every... And I mean, look, it's hard for me to do it because of where I live, but I'm going to make every effort to get to as many games I can this season. I'm going to make every effort to get together with as many supporters as I can this season. I'm going to make every effort to rewatch games with you. And we will be rewatching this on Patreon. You better believe it. Like 
because whatever comes of this season, if you're not enjoying it, it, I think we should know this by now. It doesn't come around very often. Liverpool didn't think they would be where they are this season. I guarantee you that. They didn't think they'd go from chasing 100 points to, you know, mid-table. And I'm not saying that's where we're headed, but this is a special season. We got we got to soak it up. What's your take on not letting the nervousness of wanting the title get to you so much that you miss the chance to really enjoy what's happening? I, I think everyone that I see at the ground is enjoying it immensely. And uh, oh yeah, I think oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> they literally can't wait to get there. And um, so from last week when uh, Man City uh, came back from Spurs and got to the 4-2 win, which we all knew was happening, Jamie Carragher said, and who I think is a brilliant analyst, by the way, so that's a big blow to Arsenal. I'm like smiling, saying, it's, no, it's not. <laughs> it's not a big blow to us. We've got May night the weekend. Let's just win that game. And I think that's where we all are. It's not like a pressure thing. It's like, this is really, really good. I wouldn't change a thing about it. You know, and that's, if we're at that place, that's a, that's a good thing to have. And what Arteta has done very cutely is make sure it's all done in small chunks. So normally a manager says, oh, game by game, we take one game at a time. He's brought it back to training session by training session. And that tells you his mentality. We focus on improving on a day-by-day basis. That means he's made it smaller. Keep your window small. Focus on your details. Focus on the next thing that you do. And when you get your head up, you might find yourself in a position where you've already won it. Do you know what I mean? But if you mm. focus on the outcome, on the target... On a May 27th, 28th weekend, if you focus on that, then you could get yourself in a bit of problems. But I'm going to create an environment where, by the way, you're going to focus on details and with other people, like minded people who are quality people, quality footballers. That's my job to keep you all motivated. And what was so instructive last week was the Pep Guardiola interview. He's talking about us in a way that says, mm. These guys have got it. They've got the juice, right? They're fighting for every ball. You've heard my phrase, playing football as if your fridge is empty. Well, they're playing football because they're going to bed in silk pajamas, right? They're the silk pajamas mm. team. They've already <coughs> won it. We're the team with, yep. no, with no food in the fridge. And it and it's looking like that. You know, it really is looking like that. Now, they have got the depth. And so we've got a built-in excuse. So what's the stress? We're playing a state. They've got 50, 100 million pound players on the bench. It's no, it's no drama. Just enjoy what we're doing, right? Just enjoy what we're doing. This is as good as it gets and just enjoy it. Yeah. And the football's brilliant to watch too, right? We're not doing it with rear guard action and counter attack. Like, that's the reason I, I don't feel like it's fragile or delicate because we play the kind of football that's going to create tons of chances and put opposition under pressure. Um, you know what I will say about the Leicester season, though, Tim? It seemed like a miracle. How did they do it? You look back at the names that were on those team sheets. They were all fantastic players. Some of the best players in the world, literally. Riyad Mahrez is still arguably one of the most important players for Manchester City. Conte was maybe the best player in the world at, at some point, right? Like, you look at some of those players. Vardy in his prime was a golden boot winner. Um, and all over that pitch, there were players that went on to be really important players on really good teams or, con- you know, continue to play for, for Leicester at a high level. Um, I think there's going to be a potential that we look back on this team in three or four seasons and we're like, how did they not see it coming? They had Saka and Martinelli and Jesus and Nketi and Odegaard and Zinchenko and Saliba. And I mean, it's obvious what Ben White, they were, of course they were going to win the title because in three or four seasons, all those players may have rightfully taken their place as some of the best in, in world football. That's the trajectory they're all on together. And if they all get there together, this is going to seem very obvious that this happened. But the thing that's happening for me is we haven't been in a title race in a long time. A long, long time. I forgot how existential every moment of a season (laughs) feels when you think you might be winning a title. Uh, Top four, yeah, I was nervous last season. Going to Newcastle, you kidding me? I was bricking it. But there were some moments. Every second of every game of a title-challenging season feels existential. And I'm curious if you are reconnecting with feelings that maybe we haven't really had since the early 2000s. It's, Mm -hmm. It's a long time since it's felt like it matters as much as it does right now. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, again, I find the comparison with the early George Graham sides irresistible. Mm. Um, you know what Clive was saying there about Man City? That that was Liverpool in the 80s. They, they were the silk pyjamas team and we were the one with... And like what are you talking about here? We found it so... In, in any success, there are there are different like um, there are different layers. There's fortune. So we've been. Like, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's it's a symptom of good work as well. But we've been kind of fortunate in the way that Spurs were fortunate to just happen to have an elite striker in their academy. We found like an elite winger in our academy. Um, and by the way, Smith Rowe's not bad. And by the way, we're learning that Eddie and Ketty is not bad. So we've done some good work in the mm-hmm. academy. Um, as well and that that doesn't happen by accident but sometimes it is a bit of an accident like golden generations like if everyone knew the secret to a golden generation everyone would be churning them out all the time and they don't so there is a bit of happenstance but you know we've we've found some inequalities in the market like Ben White like Aaron Ramsdale just like George Graham did like Probably in like because we look back on like the, you know the team that won it in eighty eight eighty nine for example we look back on that team and think wow they're all legends but like we got Lee Dixon and Steve Bold from Stoke we got Nigel Winterburn from Wimbledon we just happen to have one of the best defenders in English history come out of our academy in um in Tony Adams and we had David Rokos and and all these people that we've lionised but like in the mid to late eighties. No one thought when George Graham put that team together that we were going to topple Liverpool. It wasn't until it happened, you know. And and yeah, mm. I, I, I I do think there are a lot of similarities. And and at the moment, you know, to Zinchenko's point about enjoying it, I've been listening a lot recently to the you know the Diary of a CEO podcast that's, that's really yeah. popular and successful. And one of those things where I just cherry pick interviews um, of people I'm actually interested in, and and like they all have this kind of thing about like you know, when you hear interviews with successful people, it's a bit like, well, yeah, it, it, there is luck in there. But at the same time, luck is more likely to happen for you if you work hard and you do things right. You know, it's not a guarantee, but it will get you most of the way there. And that's an allegory for this game. But by the way, yeah, it drops for Inketia in the six yard box, but that's because we were constantly in their six yard box. And at the moment, and one of the reasons I'm really trying to enjoy the moment at the moment and not and try not to race ahead to May or everything else, it reminds me of that Arsene Wenger quote, you know, like the history, history gives you security, the future gives you doubt. Um, yeah. No, sorry, the present gives you doubt. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and, and that's kind of how it feels because, look, ultimately, the thing we all are going to have to eventually deal with, whether we like it or not, in May we are either going to be unbelievably happy or at this stage, we're going to be disappointed. If we finish second, we're going to be disappointed. We have to deal with that disappointment. Good. <laughs> but what, yeah, 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 exactly. But whatever happens, we're going to have to deal with something next season, either the disappointment of not winning it or we win it and we're the defending champions and everyone's out for us, right? So at the moment, we are in that sweet spot where it's developing and it feels like a boulder rolling down a hill and you just want to try and get on it and be on it. And and that, those fit, that feeling is transient, right? Because after that, you either fall off or you're the person to beat. And, and either one of those scenarios is coming. But at the moment, we're on this feeling that we've had as a fan base, probably for the last 18 months, but everyone's starting to catch it now. Everyone's seeing all the people that couldn't see what we saw last season, all the people who couldn't see last summer why we weren't absolutely crestfallen about like still regarding it as a good season. It's because we knew there's something building here and now everyone sees it. And that's going to bring its own challenges either way. But at the moment, and I think this is what Jonathan News match report captures really well. We're in that sweet spot at the moment. And uh, I, I haven't done a Simpsons quote for a while. So mm-hmm. there's uh, an early episode where uh, Marge considers having an affair with this French guy called Jacques. And as he's getting ready for the date and he's like splashing cologne on his face and he says, better than the moment itself and the aftermath is the moment of anticipation. And that's where we are at the moment. We're in the moment of anticipation and it's scary Absolutely. and it brings anxiety, but it's the best place to be. We're on the yep. journey and we can worry about the destination later. I think that's really well said and probably a great place to leave it because if you're not careful, you can do that with your whole life. 
You get the promotion. When's the next one coming? You get the apartment. When's the house? You, f you find the partner and start dating. When's the marriage? You get married. When's the baby? You get the baby. When's the second baby? You know, you, you, you get your first car. When, when's the nicer car? You, you get your win. When's the next win? You win the title. When's the next title? When's the champions league? You sign a player you love. Where's the bigger side? Like it can always be the next thing. It's so important to find a way to, to soak this up. And I do think most of us are doing that. I think it's brilliant uh, wherever it leads. Uh, I and think you know I was happier yep. when I was eighth in the league. <laughs> <laughs> of course you were. Of course you were. You long for the days of defending Lacazette, man. I know I you deal do. deal with this shit. I good good luck, do. everybody, with this. Uh, we got to enjoy it along the way. We are going to love it when we win. We're going to shit ourselves when our, when we lose, and well, that's you're it. You're just going to do a lot of meditation and be fine, dude, because you got that Eastern philosophy thing going you need for it. you. All right, let's leave it there. Paul's on Twitter. Pause my pants. Like, pause. Clive's on Twitter. Clive PFC. Thanks, Clive. Thank you very much. Tim's on Twitter at Stillmanator. Thanks, Tim. My pleasure as always. Like a boss. Look at that. My name's Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter at Yankee Gunner. We love you, and we will talk to you for goodness sake after Arsenal 10, Manchester City nil.